Well, tonight uh, is the uh, night when I was really encouraged to go as long as possible. I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, mostly the request was coming from, from the wives, and I'm not sure why that was. I want to recount to you just by a little bit way of humor an experience I had one time traveling with a, a, a foreign church leader, a Ukrainian church leader, an older gentleman who had never seen American football before, and we were traveling here in the States. He was sharing uh, some of the wonderful things the Lord was doing over in his country with some churches, and I was traveling to translate for him and, and to help him on his journey. And we were staying at a host home, and the host, you know, you know Sunday afternoon turned on a football game, and so, you know, we, you know, this Ukrainian pastor and I watched this football game together, and it was, it was the, the, funnest football game I've ever experienced because we'd be watching and he'd kind of elbow me and he'd be like, why are they fighting over that, that, that weird shaped ball? <laughs> right? You know, he's like, he's like, he's like, why can't they make the ball round? It doesn't even bounce right, you know? And, and, um, and he, why do they call it football? They, they, they only use, they mostly use their hands. And, you know, why are there people dressed like zebras who throw yellow things at people and then the other people get mad and then they have to go backwards? And it, it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, tonight, and really no connection to, to football at all, uh, we're going to be talking about the fall of man into sin. And, um, <laughs> right. So we're going to be trying to cover Genesis chapter 3 all the way through chapter 5. And if you kind of remember where we're at in our outline as we're surveying Genesis is, you know, the book is divided into four major events and then four major people. And so we talked about creation last time. Now we're going to talk about the fall. And we're going to talk about it in chapters 3 through 5. So this is the second of the four major events that the book of Genesis covers from ancient history. Now, as we look at this, the first thing that we, kind of the first major thing that we see in chapter 3 is the first sin. Let me just read to you Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you remember, <clears throat> the creation account had ended in, in chapter 1 by saying that God looked at all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, right? And then chapter 2, which is going back and giving more details about the creation of man on the sixth day, ends with talking about how Adam and Eve were not ashamed. They had no shame. There was no sin in the world. But then we come to chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. This is the fall of man. This is the first sin of man. And I want to just kind of take you through a little, a few aspects of it. First of all, look at the tempter. Who was the tempter? It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and then he comes and tempts. This was, this was Satan, right? And the scriptures give us a lot more details about the fall of Satan. But this was Satan now indwelling a beast and speaking to the woman through that beast. Look over at Revelation chapter 12. All the way at the end of the Bible, there's another reference to Satan using the term the serpent. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Actually, we'll back up, pick up a context a little bit in verse 7. There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. <clears throat> 
So here we have, again, this reference to Satan, right? The serpent of old, a reference back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. So Satan is the tempter. He is the adversary, right? He, he is the one who is the author of evil. He was the one who first rebelled against God out of his pride, out of his desire to ascend to the throne of God, to be God's equal. And now he's going to come and he's going to tempt Adam and Eve with essentially the same uh, deception, right? You can be like God. You can elevate yourselves to the position of God. And so his temptation is, is that of, of a denial of God's word, of God's authority, and of what God has said and right, is right and wrong. He starts off by saying, has God really said? Right? So the first thing he does is cast doubt on the word of God. Now I want to, you to think about this in regard to your own personal temptations. If you really examine your thought process that precedes sin, somewhere early on you will find yourself thinking, is this really a big deal? Is this really that bad? Did God really say, did God really forbid this? Did God really say I shouldn't do this? Is it really going to be so terrible if I do it? Right? Satan, before we sin, whispers, God hasn't really said. He hasn't really spoken. He injects doubt about God's word. And then he's going to inject doubt into God's motives, right? Look, the reason that God doesn't want you to eat the tree is because he knows if you eat it, you'll be like him. He's trying to keep something good from you. Look at this temptation. It's good for you. It will give you pleasure. It will give you something desirable. And God, this heavenly ogre, is trying to keep something good away from you. Right? So he's trying to cast doubt on God's word, trying to cast doubt on God's motives. And notice also what the nature of the first temptation was about. He says... As God said, the woman says, well, you know, God said if we eat from it, we'll die. And the first doctrine of Scripture that is denied by Satan is when he says, you surely will not die. The first doctrine to be denied by the devil is the doctrine of judgment. The doctrine of judgment. Think about it. The Satan could have attacked you know, a lot of different attributes of God. He could have attacked God's eternality. He could have attacked, uh, you know, God's holiness. But what's interesting is the first thing that he does is he attacks God's justice. God had said, you will surely die, and Satan directly contradicts that and says, you won't die. You can sin and not face consequences and not face judgment. Don't worry about it. God is bluffing. You're not going to surely die. And throughout history, the first agenda of Satan is to get people to reject the doctrine of judgment. Because if people believe the doctrine of judgment, they will flee the wrath to come and flee to a savior. But if there's nothing to be saved from, you have no use for a savior. And so, if you look at what the cults teach, if you look at what kind of the general thing of the world is, isn't it interesting that the single idea that the world loves to quote is, don't judge. They rip that out of context. They forget that Jesus also said, judge with righteous judgment. But they want to say, look, God is a God of love. We believe in heaven, but we do not believe in hell. There's no wrath to come. There's no judgment. There's no real consequences for sin. Therefore, whatever you want to live, however is fulfilling to you, go ahead and live that way. There is no consequence. There's no judgment day. There is no lake of fire. There is no hell. Hell. 
This goes all the way back to Genesis 3, 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. This is the temptation. And then there's the tragedy, verse 6, right? The woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he also ate. Now I want to put up on the screen for you a little comparison between three different passages. First, John chapter 2, verse 16, and then Genesis 3, 6, which we just read, and then Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. So we look at this first temptation in Genesis 3, 6, right? And it says that the tree, she saw that the tree was good for food. First John chapter 2, verse 16 says that everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, right? These are all things that don't come from God. They come from the world system, which is dominated by Satan, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you look at the temptations of Eve in verse 6, you'll see that each of these three are there. She saw that the tree was good for food. This was the lust of the flesh, she saw, it says, it was pleasant to the eyes. This is, John calls, the lust of the eyes. And then it was desirable to make one wise, right? This is the boastful pride of life, as John calls it. But notice that where the first Adam, the first representative of mankind, failed because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the second representative of mankind, Jesus Christ, the second, what, the second Adam, Succeeded. When he's tempted in the wilderness, Satan comes to him with similar categories of temptations. For example, Satan says to him, Command this stone to become bread. Right? So, you know, just like Eve saw that the tree was good for food, he's saying, Command these stones to become bread. He's appealing to the lust of the flesh. And then the devil, it says, took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, All of these can be yours if you'll worship me. And these kingdoms of the world were pleasant to the eyes. The devil is trying to appeal to the lust of the eyes. And then the devil tells Jesus, takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, says, throw yourself down from here, right? Test God, right? This proud testing of the Lord. And this is the pride of life. A rebellious type of wisdom that rejects God's and Jesus responded, of course, to all those temptations by saying, it is written, right? It is written. It is written. So what's interesting is the devil's temptation starts by casting doubt on the word of God. Jesus triumph over the temptation of Satan comes when he says, it is written. It is written. So where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. And Jesus came to restore that which was lost and defiled when man fell. So we have the first sin. Then secondly, we have the first false religion. Look at chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I, would, I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So this is really the first false religion. Notice that in this false religion, right, false religion is man's attempt to solve his own sin problem, to save himself. He sins. Now think about it. Satan told them, Look, you know what? You won't surely die. And then all of a sudden they sin against God and all of a sudden now the, the threat of judgment comes upon them. And they're terrified, right? But what do they do? Instead of going to God, they run from him and then they try to solve the problem themselves. 
This is the first false religion. Man trying to undo what he's done to save himself. And in this false religion, there's no revelation. There's no revelation. They just make it up. They just kind of make it up as they go along. And one of the character traits of false religions is how they change over time. They just make things up as they go along. So think, for example, of the Mormon church, which is very rooted in Genesis, very rooted in the same type of deceptions that Satan told Adam and Eve, right? I mean, they teach that people can become gods, just as Satan said to Adam and Eve, you can be like God. Mormonism official doctrine is that God used to be like us, and we can be like him. We can become gods. They're essentially just teaching as doctrine the deceptions of Satan. But another aspect of Mormonism and, and, and many of the other false religions in the world is that they change to correct the errors, and they change to correct things that are unpopular. So, for example, you go back a few years, and if you, know, if you didn't have white skin, you couldn't be a member of the Mormon church, and then they found out that's unpopular as society changed, and so they got a revelation that that now is different. So you just have people making it up as they go along. There's no revelation in false religion. God is not the source of their doctrine. Man is. We see the same thing in many other cults and world religions. Secondly, there's no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice in this first false religion. God had said the wages of sin is death, but there's no sacrifice here. There's an attempt to cover the sin without atoning for the sin. This is the challenge of the modern day Judaism. They have no sacrifice for sin. Though they know that God has said without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness for sin, even though they have God's law and the sacrificial system, there have been no sacrifices since 70 AD, since the Lord allowed the Romans to destroy the temple to end the sacrificial system forever as a powerful point that Christ's sacrifice was the once and final sacrifice for sins. Since that time, there's been no sacrifices, but yet they think that sin can be covered even without atonement. And many false religions follow this line of thinking. There's some way you can cover your sin without atoning for it. But the wages of sin is death, and Hebrews 9.22 says very clearly that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. A third aspect of this first false religion was there's no forgiveness. Unsurprisingly, when there's no revelation, you're just making it up, there's no atonement, there's no sacrifice, you're just trying to cover your sin some way, there's also no forgiveness. Guilt remains. Verse 8, when they hear the Lord God walking they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord because their guilt and their shame remains. The fear still remains. Watch a characteristic of workspace religions. People who hold to workspace religions spend their entire lives running from God. Doing the minimum it takes to try to appease Him but trying to stay as far away from him as they possibly can because their deeds are evil and because they still bear the guilt of their sin. There's no real forgiveness in workspace religions. Guilt was not relieved for Adam and Eve because no payment for sin was made. There was no atonement. And then there was no repentance in this false religion. No repentance. Notice that when they're confronted by God, they don't take responsibility. Adam blame shifts and points at Eve, right? It was, hey, look, it was the woman that you gave me, God, right? It's your fault and her fault, not mine. When God confronts Eve, she says, well, the devil made me do it. So there's no real repentance, no taking of 
personal responsibility. This is the first false religion, right? Those four elements are common to false religions. No revelation, no sacrifice, no forgiveness, and no genuine repentance. That's the first false religion. Then in chapter 3, verses 14 through 24, we see the first judgment. The first judgment. First, there's the judgment on the serpent. And the physical nature of serpents was changed in a humiliating way. They are consigned to crawling on their belly and licking the dust. This is a visual representation, an illustration that we get to observe in nature that reminds us, it's God's illustrative reminder of his judgment upon Satan, the one who had indwelled and used the serpent in his temptation of Eve. It's a visual reminder. We see a snake crawling on its belly and licking the dust. It should be a reminder of the humiliation of Satan at the hands of God. This is a declaration of war, by the way, verses 14 and 15, right? There's a declaration of war. He says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. See, Satan thought he had really won this great coup, right? This great victory because man was God's chosen ruler over the created world and Satan had convinced man to submit to him and to follow him and so he thought he had control in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3 God declares war on the serpent and says that he is going to work amongst mankind to wage war against the serpent what's interesting is God does not say I'm going to put Okay, so man has followed Satan, right? So they've now allied themselves with him. It's not going to be a war between Satan, the fallen angels, and fallen man, and then God and the holy angels. He says, I'm actually going to work from within mankind. I'm going to save these fallen beings, and there's going to be internal warfare in this kingdom of darkness, right? God's basically saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a guerrilla war in this kingdom of darkness. There are going to be people that I save out of this, this pagan world, out of this demon-controlled, dark, cursed world, and I am going to use them to wage war against the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And then here is the great promise of the Savior. He this singular person who's going to be born of a woman, he shall crush your head and you will merely bruise him on the heel. So there's the judgment on the serpent and the declaration of war. Then there's a judgment on the woman in verse 16. I'm going to greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Here begins the battle of the sexes, right? It begins with blame shifting. Her fault, you know. <laughs> and here is a curse which still exists today. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Eve, you've chosen to listen to the deceiver. You're going to face the consequences now of living under the tyrannical rule of evil and wicked men. There's a judgment on Adam and on all of the creation. To Adam, he says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. Right? So the world falls under the curse because its representative ruler, Adam, follows evil and follows Satan. And so the whole creation, Paul says, groans because of the sin of man. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you are taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. Look, you came from dust. You're going to spend your whole life picking and hoeing and digging in the dirt until you go back to it. 
You will claw the dirt to try to eke out a living. And instead of the garden where you merely tended the garden in its bounty as God makes it grow, now you're going to labor by the sweat of your brow and no matter how hard you try, you're going to experience futility in your toil because you're going to work and it's going to produce thorns and thistles. So the fulfilling work which God had, remember we talked about that God gave Adam a good job, right? I mean, a very fulfilling life task in the garden. Now that work becomes toilsome, burdensome, futile. Your best efforts falling flat. Working for years and then losing your job. Getting laid off. Saving and saving to purchase a home and only to have a fire or mold or something destroy it. It is the futility that is experienced by all of mankind. So you have the judgment on man and on the creation. The world is under a curse. But then we also have in this passage the first gospel prophecy. I already alluded to it in verse 15. There's coming this Savior, verse 15, who's going to crush the serpent. This is the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel prophecy, the promise of the Savior, someone who's going to crush this cruel, tyrannical ruler that man has subjected himself to. And then we see in verse 21 also the first substitutionary sacrifice. It says that, uh, verse 20, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And then verse 21, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So here they had made their own attempt to cover their sin, but there was no sacrifice, there was no atonement. So God, in his mercy... He sacrifices. He takes an animal, that animal is slain, and the Lord clothes them with the skin of the slain animal. This is the powerful first lesson about atonement for mankind. God had said the wages of sin is death. And they deserved that death, both physical and spiritual and eternal. But God in his mercy takes a substitute, and the substitute, this animal, is killed in their place. It's the first death that ever occurs in creation, and it's the first time Adam and Eve have ever seen the shedding of blood, the first time they've ever seen death. And as they watch it happen, they are being taught. The wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life. Through a substitutionary atonement in which the innocent takes the place of the guilty. This is the first gospel of prophecy. Then we have the first generational degradation. The first generational degradation. This is chapter 4, verses 1 through 24, right? God, at the end of chapter 3, drives Adam and Eve out of the garden. They're now out in the cursed world. And we see in chapter 4 chronicled a generational degradation that the fallenness of man now gets worse and worse and worse. We see in the first five verses the first cult. We see Cain offering kind of his own. He, he kind of makes up his own offering to give to the Lord. He rebels against God and brings an offering, not a substitutionary blood sacrifice offering as he was supposed to, and as his brother did, but brings his own. He, he's going to twist this idea of sacrifice and make the first cult, and it was not accepted. Cain was faithless and proud. He thought he could invent his own way of approaching God and atoning for sin. But he was wrong, as all cults and false religions are. And that leads to the first rage and the first depression, right? Verses 5 through 7 God has no regard for Cain's offering. It says, So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do what is right, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. 
You have the first rage, and that leads to the first lie and the first murder in verse 8. Cain told his Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So here you have the first murder and the first lie, or the, the first lie spoken by human lips at least. Then you have the first war in verses 13 through 24. We're going to have people going out and there's going to be conflict between them. We're going to see, for example, in verse 23, that Lamech kills a man for wounding him and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And so we see the first instances of this warfare, man killing man and grouping into groups to create power. We have the first instance of polygamy, the first perversion of marriage in chapter 4, verse 19. Lamech took to himself two wives in contradiction and in, and in absolute rejection of God's designed for marriage. So you have the first generational degradation. You just see in chapter 4 all of the things that scourge man coming and coming and coming. But we also see at the end of chapter 24 and then on through chapter, or I'm sorry, at the end of chapter 4 and then through chapter 5, the first generational revival. We see the righteous line of Seth. Seth is born in place of Abel, it says in verse 25. Adam's, Adam had relation with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. So Seth is born in Abel's place. This Abel, the, the righteous brother, the one who wanted to follow the Lord, he's killed by evil Cain, leaving now, right, leaving the wicked to have the upper hand, but God gives Abel in place, or gives Seth in place of Abel, and Seth begins this righteous line, generations that seek the Lord and follow him. And so true worship is restored in chapter 4, verse 26. It says, To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time men began to call upon the name of the Lord. This righteous line begins to seek God's face to restore true worship. And so we see great hope. Chapter 5 begins by reminding us that the image of God, though marred by the fall, was not completely destroyed. The image of God in man. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. And so here you have a reminder that man still bears the imago Dei. He still is made in the image of God, and this image of God is now passed down from Adam to his sons. So God is not completely rejected man. There is still a great plan and a great place for man in God's redemptive plan. And chapter 5 ends with something absolutely remarkable. Well, it's near the end. Chapter 5, verse 24, towards the end now of this second major event, the fall, the account of the fall, we see something amazing. We see the first rapture. The first rapture, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was not, for God took him. Now, until verse 24, there's been these genealogies, and they all follow a pattern. He lives, he dies. He lives, he dies, right? All the days of Jared, verse 20, were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. All the days of Enoch, verse 23, were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So there's this repeated pattern, right? I mean, look at any of the verses of chapter 5, right? You know, Enosh, all the days of Enosh, verse 11, were 905, and he died. 
Verse 14, all the days of Kenan were 910, and he died. Verse 17, all the days of Mahalal were 895 years, and he died. Then we get to Enoch. It says he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. This is the first rapture. This is the first rapture. And Jude shows that Enoch was a prophet who prophesied about the end times in a way that is very reminiscent of the preaching that the two witnesses will do in the book of Revelation. And you're going to ask me, well, do you think Enoch is one of the two witnesses? I, I do. I, there's, lots, there's some reasons I hold that view. But the real answer is we don't know who the two witnesses are. Is it Moses and Elijah, those who, who appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration? Or is it Enoch and Elijah, the only two men who never died? There were both just taken to heaven. And Revelation talks about two witnesses that God will send to share the gospel. Now, after the church has been raptured, there's these two witnesses who come to share the gospel with the world. And there's this great revival that then sweeps the world one last time during the tribulation. And then those two witnesses are killed by their enemies. And based on the verse in Hebrews where it says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that to face the judgment, I believe those two witnesses are likely, I, we can't know because they're not named, are likely to be Enoch who did not die and Elijah who also did not die. Remember he was taken in a chariot of fire to heaven. And I think that these two men were taken and interestingly both Enoch and Elijah were prophets and Enoch Jude says specifically prophesied about the end times and so I believe that he at least may be one of those two witnesses at the end and so chapter 5 ends with this great hope this great hope I mean here you have sin enter the world the wages of sin is death but there's been atonement and then Enoch walks with God and God just takes him to heaven it's a powerful lesson for man that God saves by grace and that faith in him can result in salvation from sin and from death so that was kind of the second section the second major event in Genesis we've seen the first sin the first false religion, the first judgment, the first gospel prophecy, the first generational degradation, and then the first generational revival ending with that great, amazing, first powerful example of a mortal man being taken to heaven because of his faith in God walking with God. Well, that kind of ends our little survey of the fall. I'm sure you have lots of questions. In the coming weeks, we're going to kind of take a pause. We're going to cover the flood um, next week. And then after we cover the flood, we're, we're going to kind of, when we get kind of to the end of the four major events of ancient history, we're going to then pause and I'm going to do a little mini-series covering some of the kind of common questions and so, even some of the objections to the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So we're going to keep working our way through the first 11 chapters through the flood and then uh, all the way leading up to the call of Abraham in chapter 12. And we're going to kind of survey that whole section, Genesis 1 through 11. And then we're going to go back and we're going to cover some kind of key issues more thematically, look at some of the challenges that the unbelieving world offers to this amazing and vital and foundational portion of Scripture. So I hope you'll stay with us and uh, look forward to walking through these wonderful portions of scriptures together but let's end our time together with prayer Lord we come before you as we read and are reminded about the fall of man into sin Lord how we are reminded of grace Lord you the holy one the righteous judge the one who promises that you will not let the guilty go unpunished Lord you had every right every right by justice and by every standard of holiness and morality to wipe your enemies off the face of the earth along with the great deceiver whose word they obeyed instead of yours. Lord, it amazes us that we stand this day 
before you, that we can approach your throne with confidence. We know we can do so only by grace. We thank you, Lord, for atonement, for the substitution of the innocent for the guilty, prefigured and shadowed in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, which began in Eden, but culminated in the cross to which it pointed the once and for all perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being our substitute. For it is only by your death, your burial, your resurrection that we can stand in the presence of the one who is holy, holy, holy. So we worship you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace and warm up your DVRs.